What is up, everybody, and welcome to the Mind, Body, and Pockets podcast, where we take lessons learned from people in the marching arts community to help you level up your life. I'm Eddie. And I'm Paula. And on this podcast, we're going to get to know the individuals who make up the marching arts community. They'll share their experiences in and out of the activity and the mental, physical, and financial lessons they've learned along the way. Today, we have Drew Lentzalata on the MBP podcast. Drew is the creator and host of the Anxious Truth podcast, which is on track to hit 1 million downloads by the end of 2020. He's also the author of two fantastic books, An Anxiety Story and The Anxious Truth, a step-by-step guide to overcoming anxiety, panic, and agoraphobia. Through his own bouts with anxiety, panic disorder, and depression, Drew learned how to understand and overcome those debilitating issues and has helped countless people do the same. To top it all off, Drew is also a musician and member of the drum corps community, marching mellophone with the Long Island Kingsmen in the 80s. We're honored to spend some time with him to discuss drum corps, mental health, and more. So please help us in welcoming to the podcast, Mr. Drew Lentzalata. Welcome. All right, Drew, (laughs) what's going on? Thank you, Paula, Eddie, for having me. Very cool. Digging the guitars in the background. If I have the ceiling fan on, this one will sway. The acoustic will sway. So it becomes known as the ghost guitar. Oh, nice. (laughs) Very cool. That's awesome. So, yeah, thank you so much for for coming on the show and and doing this. Um, You know, anxiety, millions of people deal with some sort of anxiety or anxiety disorder. Um, And I've just found that in the performing arts activity, there are a lot of people that uh, have to deal with these issues, mm-hmm. but it's kind of taboo. Like not everybody's comfortable talking about it. So, um, I myself also, uh, as Eddie knows, <laughs> deal, uh, have, have had anxiety going on in my life for uh, a while. And we'll touch on that later, but I just, um, mm. over the years have met other people and know that it's an issue mm-hmm. in our activity. So I thought it'd be amazing, uh, to have you on and, and share your expertise with everybody. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Yeah, I'm so excited because I've heard a lot about you, but I have nothing. I don't know anything yet, so I'm so excited about getting to know you and and seeing how much you've helped Paula. I'm just grateful myself because it, it's showing me another way to kind of help on the other side of things. Um, yeah, but tell yeah. us a little bit about yourself. You did drum court. What was that? Where did you start? What years did you do? Where did you march? I, I did. I did. So I spent one summer, it should have been two. And I, and I think I was telling Paul, like, I, I blew it. I did an audition for Garfield in 84. They, they were Garfield at the time, right? Yeah, yeah. So And that was West Side Story. It was a second second medal. And I thought, oh, West Side Story, and that's going to suck. Oh, man. Was, <laughs> was I it's so wrong? I could not have been more wrong. Like, oh, one no. of the great regrets of my life. So I went and like, got a job instead. But anyway, I was, so I marched for one summer with a small corps on Long Island called the Long Island Kingsman. And the Kingsman had been around for quite a long time, um, but unfortunately folded only a year or two after that. I, I think I marched 83. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that point, the Corps was already having financial troubles and the tour was kind of shortened. We weren't able to do you know, the whole thing. But it was a great, great, great experience. I had so much fun doing it. And it was a super young core. We had, um, I mean, I'll give you the, the 60 second version, I guess. My, my band director in high school, my marching band was a core style band in the midst of no core style band. So we were like the 800 pound gorilla on Long Island at the time. So I was a French horn player and I had been playing the horn since middle school. And I, you know, I, I was all state horn and that sort of stuff. So I was, I was good. And I became the drum major of my high school band. And the associate director was an old drum corps guy. He was a Garfield guy. Uh, so nice. yeah, yeah. And he was he was uh, really very active with the Long Island Sunrisers, which was a senior corps at the time, DCA corps. Mm-hmm. So he uh, started working with the Kingsmen again. And he recruited a bunch of us from Brentwood uh, to go to the corps. And we did. Uh, and in the end, in Brentwood, we had a very large, it's a big school. And we had a very large marching band. So we had a giant brass line uh, to go with the woodwinds. But the secret, our secret sauce back in the day, and this is talking about the early 80s, so it was not nearly musical like you would expect it to be, but we were loud and, you know, we would would melt your face off because we would take, every summer we'd take 30 or 40 woodwind players and hand them trumpets and teach them how to play. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's, I love that. (laughs) Yes. So, and so we had this massive core style brass sound coming out of a high school marching band. 
eh, you know, you wouldn't really look too highly on it today, but at the time it was, it was cool. And that sort of continued on in the Kingsman because it was a very small group and we were trying to fill spots in the horn line. And so we had a couple of woodwind conversion players, even in that horn line. So it was very young, very group, very inexperienced, but still it was a good experience. That's made friends awesome. And, yeah. Did you yeah. guys do a, a, a full tour or how, how did that work out? We did it. Well, we were planning to do a full tour, but there were financial issues with the core, mm -hmm. unfortunately, which happens in a small core. And so we had to abbreviate it. We went as far as DCI South. Uh, I don't remember where DCI was that year finals, but we did not make it that far because we had to, we had to cut it South, but that was also back in the day where there was still now there's DCI East, but there was literally DCE, which you guys are yeah. for drum Corps East. Oh, so okay. like the, probably the highlight of our tour was DCE championships, which was always held in Lynn, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And you know, there back in the day, there was DCE drum Corps South drum Corps Midwest. There were separate circuits. I don't think they exist anymore. No, they don't. I, no. I'm actually, from new york so I, you just brought so many flashbacks of things um yes just from yeah. the city like it, the garden state championships and all those small little things yes. that we did locally were, that was awesome. garden state circuit yeah yep, yep. so we had uh, best friends yep no. <laughs> we, we totally did so back in the back in those days there was one more core from long island i believe they were called the medford grenadiers and they were garden state core so we would never necessarily compete but there was that sort of invisible rivalry between yeah. two cords that were tiny and hurting and never competed <laughs> yet we thought we were rivals and then there was a, a core from the city called the cmcc warriors yeah. is this name now yep somehow they were associated with the city of new york somehow mm -hmm. i don't know how i think but, they were based out of there yeah there's a few different cords yeah. that, that merged together or something oh, yeah and somehow stuff. the city was they were involved they were like a youth activity and the city was sponsoring yeah. them or whatever so yeah it was it was cool though we'd run into those guys all the time and i had a great time great what a, a great small time. world yeah. Yeah. i love that i love that yeah yeah so, so fell, funny, fellow right? mellophone player Yes, awesome. I was a mid-range person through That's and through, right. but yeah. So you know, when you're when you're a horn player, I played all, like all the brass instruments, which I know you can relate to, and mm -hmm. you, I'm sure you played them better than I did. But yeah, so I walked into the Kingsman, and they handed me a soprano and said, "You're you're the soprano soloist." And <laughs> yeah, that that no, like I just wasn't suited to be a soprano player. I went two valve bugles at the time, G uh, playing in G, and uh, so after about one or two rehearsals, I'm like, "Yeah, you got to give me a mellophone, man. That's that's my jam." And so. <laughs> So they wound up in the end, like the show kind of featured a lot of mellophone solos that didn't exist when it was originally written. And uh, so there you go. That's how that turned out. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to find like an old, dig up an old tape yeah, I'm sure of that. We find yeah. something. Yeah. I, I found one last night. Really? So when you asked me for a picture, uh -huh. I had to go, there's a little Facebook group for the 83, 84 Kingsman that I'm in and someone had posted and I believe from DCE Championships in Lynn, Massachusetts. So there is a recording. I'll send you the link. That's wow. awesome. It was a awesome. little, little rough, a yeah. little rough, but we had a lot of 13 year olds and, you know, it was a young, very yeah. young group. That's what it was back then. Yeah. Though, you know, there's so many cores in the Northeast too. that needed its own little circuit. Mm -hmm. you know? it, it did. Yeah. We'd see cores like North Star and wow. 27th was still huge at the time. Yeah. 27 was still a thing and the Bridgman were still competing. Oh, yeah. And big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was big. And when you look back at the activity and what it was then and what it was now, it's almost unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Almost, you know, just there's one lonely like mallet player on the sidelines. And <laughs> it's like, yeah. wow, it seems so raw. Yeah, it's really Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is yeah. right now. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But at least I did play a do valve bugle. I didn't do valve rotor. But the contrabasses <laughs> were valve rotor. Oh. Yeah. Remember yeah, Contras? Remember Contras? Contras. Yeah, glad I never uh, had to deal with anything <laughs> of the sort. I can and deal now, with yeah. not seeing in front of me, but you know, having all that <laughs> bathtub on your shoulder and no thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Know. Anyway, so yeah, I'm from I'm the old G Bugle guys. So, so that's the deal. Yeah. So uh, for those of you guys that are, are listening, watching that don't know Drew, you heard it in the intro, but I'm going to say it again. Um, he has an incredibly awesome, popular podcast about anxiety and panic disorder called The Anxious Truth, and that's where I first found out about Drew, stumbled upon, actually, I stumbled upon your Facebook group first. Probably, Through yeah. another group, which was not the best of groups, but we'll get into <laughs> uh, that later. So I, I okay. found your your group, and I'm like, okay, this is this is where I want to be. Um, and yeah. then from there, yeah, I found, I found the podcast, and um, I'm just very excited for everybody listening, um, whether if you're listening and you are dealing with an anxiety disorder or some sort of anxiety, or you have somebody in your life that you love that is, and you just want to learn more. Um, this is going to be super, super awesome. So Drew, I just, the first thing I want to ask is like, how did uh, anxiety grace you with its presence? 
Oh yeah, it was so it was so great. I was so lucky. <laughs> um, I had my first experience with that. Uh, I was it was 1986, so I was a sophomore in college, and I was home for spring break. And uh, that one night, I just I was hanging out in the house I grew up in. Everything was going great. I was getting great grades. Everything was awesome in my life. And I I had my first panic attack, and I had no idea what it was. I'd never even heard the word panic attack, so I just assumed like. Oh, well, it's been a good 19 year run. I guess this is over now. And I, tr I truly interpreted it as this must be what it feels like when you die. That's what I thought it was happening um, because I experienced derealization and depersonalization first. And then that kicked off all the other symptoms. And that was that was quite a roller coaster that night. And that set me right down a path that, you know, lasted sort of on and off for many, many years until I actually finally solved the problem in 20, 2008. So you mm -hmm. do the math. You know, yeah. it was a long time. Uh, yeah, that's how it started for me, that first panic attack. Yeah, and just out of the yeah. blue, too, which is always and fun. I still don't know why. I mean, you know, I'm sure that many people, and many people have asked me that. Haven't you ever fig tried to figure out why it happened? No, I haven't, because it hasn't been relevant. Maybe one day I'll have some sort of epiphany and I'll say, oh, that's why. But if mm -hmm. I don't ever, then that's okay, too. Yeah. It wasn't required for me anyway. Sure, it happened and... Yeah, <laughs> it happened. that's it. That's all I know. Yeah, yeah. for me, actually, it was at drum corps. So I, I do want to share it? this story. Yeah, because I haven't really not many people know this, um, but they're about to. Uh, so it was actually uh, I was 17 my, my first summer of cadets and uh, we had moved in for spring training. And we had like a camp over the weekend and then we were going to drive to our housing site for spring training. So we did the camp. I get there and I'm like unpacking my stuff and caption head comes over and he goes oh by the way um there's gonna be a solo in the, in the beginning of the show and uh you're gonna play it and i was like excuse me what <laughs> you know so here i am at my dream drum corps you're gonna play this solo now i'm like okay cool i was excited but you know i, I think that might have had something to do with it so whatever we finished the camp everything's great we go get something to eat burger king get back on the bus and then i sit down and I just started feeling kind of weird and, and my heart was like racing, but like yeah. out of nowhere, the typical. And I asked my friend, uh, Kristen, I said, Hey, is my heart like beating really fast? And she was like, Oh my God. Yeah, it is. So there's something like that. So that's like, <laughs> boom, right. you know, just sets you off. To exactly. Um, yeah, so, yeah. but you know, nobody, nobody understood what was happening. So I, I totally get it. Uh, so they got me off the bus and it just kind of spiraled from there. And the admin guys, freaking out in the van driving me to the nearest you know urgent care or whatever and, you know yeah. the whole uh as you called it in in your your first book the uh buffet the all you can eat buffet of <laughs> of uh symptoms was happening and and yeah, yeah like yeah. like you you just mentioned it I thought well i guess i guess this is it like you yeah. know because what else i've never experienced anything like that before it was like out of nowhere and i thought yeah i i, I I finally make it to my drum core of my dreams and now I'm going to die, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So uh, before the first show, I'm not exactly. even going to make it to the first I didn't even get to put the uniform on. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that's kind of how it happened. And, and, uh, they take you in there and run all the tests. And then I just remember them saying, yeah, it's uh it's just anxiety. And I think yeah, that's, you had a panic attack. yeah, you had a panic attack. And I think that's the first time that I heard that term, I believe it just, yeah. It was like, Why would all you? right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Why, why would you hear the term? I, I never heard the term either. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. What was interesting about my experience is it happened while I was at home. I did not have anybody say the word panic attack to me for months, probably. Wow. Yeah. So I truly did not know what it was. What's interesting is I did not interpret it as any particular thing with, that was killing me, like a heart attack or a stroke, just generally speaking, death. I like, so it was really weird, but it took me a long time before I actually saw a doctor or a medical profession that said, oh, you're having a panic attack. I mm -hmm. did. I did, had no idea. No idea. Oh. Yeah. So strange. Well, you have to remember also, there's no internet. 1986, I couldn't yeah. Google right. it. I couldn't, yeah. you know, I was like, I was, whatever. I didn't know anybody who ever had anything, su such a thing. So it was just, yeah. I don't know, I figured it out on my own. Yeah. So, and for for yeah. me, it was, it was 2002. So there was internet, but like, we didn't have smartphones. Not like today. Exactly. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm back at the housing site and I still really don't know what happened. And I, there's no information on it either. They, they gave me right. a bottle of pills <laughs> and they said, you'll be fine, which I never took. And I'm, I'm yeah. very grateful that I, that I never did, but. 
Yeah. I know a lot of times the first thing they'll do is give you even like a antihistamine, like mm. it's because Ben, like Benadryl, it'll you know make you sleepy. So I've seen that too, but mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot yeah. of progressions from then to now, I guess, huh? A lot of information oh, yeah. out there now too. Um, yeah. That, that, that brings me to, you, you mentioned a couple things um, after the first question, you said like depersonalization and stuff uh, about some of the systems. Could you unpack that a little bit for us? Yep. Some of us that might yeah, not absolutely. be so familiar. So, you know, there is uh, panic attacks and waves of s extreme anxiety come with very predictable symptoms that, you know, we could list them all, but there's no point in doing it. But some of the most common are the racing heart. These are the effects of adrenaline, racing heart, hard to breathe, feels like you got a tight band against your chest. You're a little bit, di or you feel dizzy, you're disoriented. Um, the tingling hands, feet, nose, numb face, that's hyperventilation. And depersonalization and derealization, which are dissociative states, if you want to talk about the technical, like behavioral scientist term, a de depersonalization is when you, you don't feel like you're real anymore. So imagine looking at yourself in the mirror, but suddenly you look at yourself in the mirror every morning when you shave or whatever, and you don't give it a second thought. But when you're depersonalized, you give it all the thoughts and you don't look right. And you're trying to come to grips with what you're looking at. And derealization is when the world outside of you no longer feels real. And it's so funny because you guys would appreciate this. The way I have always described it, even to this day, is being an eighth note off from reality. Uh, so I'm, I'm wow, just, I'm, yeah. I'm, fa I would call, I would literally call it phasing, which I know you guys will appreciate. Uh, like, I love that. That's great. Yes. And it's so, so right no one on ever knows too. why, but yes, yeah. I was like, you know, it's like when you're phasing and people would be like, huh? And I'm like, oh, forget it. Just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm a little off. I'm like an eighth of an eighth note off from reality right now. And uh, that's what it feels like. You're that's just uncomfortable. You're not connected to it. Uh, it's, uh, a, it's super uncomfortable. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, sorry. I just, right now, I just got on that level and got some goosebumps thinking about that just because I, I understand a little bit more now after you um, unpack yeah. that for us. Uh, are there different types of anxiety or is, is that like the main, like I guess, steps of symptoms that you would normally feel? Uh, well, there are different types of anxiety. I mean, every human being experiences anxiety of some kind. So when you find that you're going to play the solo at the beginning of the show, you're probably experienced some form of anxiety or another, you know, there's a worry, there's fear, there's uncertainty. Those are all forms of anxiety that every human being experiences from time to time. But when you realm into the situation, when you kind of get into the realm where you're experiencing anxiety disorder or persistent bouts of anxiety, there are different disorders like generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, social anxiety, health anxiety, OCD, panic disorder, panic disorder with agoraphobia. They all have the same physical symptoms that come along with them. The body is only has a limited range of what it can play when handed the anxiety score. You're like, so, you know, um, so we all experience very similar symptoms, just sometimes within different contexts. So people that have what I had, which was panic disorder, and I guess, Paula, where, where you were too, when you experience panic a panic attack, many people experience panic attacks in their life once or twice, and they shake it off and it's over and they think, oh, that was weird, and they never think about it again. But people who develop panic disorder become so afraid of repeating the experience that they start to worry about it. If it's going to happen again, you start to predict it and you begin to avoid things that you think might make it happen or the situations that you were in. So you're lucky that you did not develop like, I got to get out of here and go home. You would have missed your whole core experience, you know? Yeah. It's, which, it's, which would be super common. Most yeah. people, many people would have done that. Like, I got to get out of here now because this clearly is not a safe place to be. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. really shocked that I, I didn't, you know, it kind of. I don't even know if it crossed my mind. Maybe I was just too young to to really yeah. understand. Um, but it was rough for a little bit. And I do remember, you know, wanting to go home and pro probably just because it's your, your first year and it's difficult. It's hard. You know, everything's physically right. taxing, mentally taxing. But I got over that and, you know, I was fine. And, but if I if I didn't, or if I had taken that medication and maybe, it, you know, I wouldn't be able to, to be in the sun or rehearse. So it's just, you know, I'm glad it worked out the way that, that it did. And it would have yeah. changed the whole trajectory of my life. We would not be. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> a thing. Ever. Right. Yeah. yeah. Imagine. So, Imagine. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. And in the end, the fact that you did not run and escape from that situation is what kept you, which what got you over it in the end, because that that avoidance leads to the disorder taking bigger and bigger hold in your life and avoidance in its ultimate form becomes agoraphobia, people who wind up stuck in their homes and that sort of stuff. So but this, the feelings and the physical sensations and the, this, the thoughts, the catastrophic thoughts are generally the same. 
We just experience them in different contexts, depending on what the disorder actually is. If that makes any kind of sense. Absolutely. It's, it's starting to click a lot more for me. And I'm gl so glad you're here because I'm, I'm now, well, it was when you said OCD, because I, I, I haven't had many like panic attacks or anxiety in my life, but I definitely have a little case of OCD, uh, maybe a big case of OCD if I'm being very transparent. And when I don't do certain things, there is a certain discomfort that comes up over my body, but then I do the thing and then it's gone. But I do the thing so often, the things that I don't really feel that anxiety. And I'm just like, is that what you feel every single time that, whoa, really? Uh, <laughs> so okay. We, right we can now. talk about that. We can talk about that for a minute. Please. So, that obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, is a pretty hot topic right now. And I'm involved with a lot of people who are dealing with OCD. I did not, almost every anxiety disorder comes with some obsessive compulsive component at some point. So when I was at the worst of panic disorder and agoraphobia, I developed obsessive thoughts uh, that were based on like uh, being poisoned by food. I mean, literally poisoned, like someone, I don't want to open the new thing of orange juice because what if somebody tampered with it? Those was my obsessions, you know? So it comes with almost any, any if it's sufficiently advanced anxiety disorder. But OCD, when you just said, if I don't do the things, it, it gives yeah. you that, dis that uncomfortable feeling. So you do the things mm -hmm. and then it takes away the, the discomfort. That's exactly what OCD is. So if you don't, but you keep, repeating that cycle i'm guessing yes you feel the need to do them Absolutely. so you do them and and you you get some sort of comfort until you have to do them again and then you do them again and then so the yeah yes those are the compulsions and the compulsions drive the obsessions so when you treat ocd you literally learn to not do the compulsions which makes you super uncomfortable yeah, and afraid <laughs> but you learn that you did not ever have to do the compulsions mm -hmm. so the basis of almost every anxiety disorder is that you become irrationally afraid you are legitimately afraid. That's real fear and real discomfort, but the basis for it is not real. So you think that if you don't, whatever it happens to be, your compulsion is something bad will happen. You might not even know what, you just know that it makes you uncomfortable. For somebody who has a panic attack, they are convinced that this, the panic itself becomes the danger to them. Ugh. Yes, Light bulb. the anxiety itself becomes the driver of anxiety. So a lot of people who deal with these disorders will try to dig and dig and dig for like, what, what's, the, what's the root cause? What do I have trauma? Was it my mom? Like, what was it? And maybe, but when you develop the disorder where the anxiety itself is what fuels more anxiety, you've disconnected from the root cause anyway. So it doesn't matter. Wow. It, be, it, it perpetuates itself. It's a self-burning fire. So think of the root cause as a match. You light the fire and then... Maybe you find the root cause and blow it out, but the fire's still burning too late. You already lit the fire. Uh, so. Yeah. That's like the fear, yeah. of, the fear of fear. The fear of fear. It's mm -hmm. the, the fear of being afraid. Yeah, exactly. Wow. That's, that's, that's huge. <laughs> Sorry. It's just well, all these yeah. light bulbs are going welcome. off in my head. I, I, well, thank you. Welcome yeah. to yeah. my brain, <laughs> Paula. <laughs> well, Come on in. That's the thing, because once you do the things, there's a certain level of comfort that comes. But let's say the bad thing doesn't happen after you you've done whatever you do. There's a certain level of justification that comes with that as well. I was like, see, Bam. because I did it, <laughs> it didn't happen. That's right. That's right. And then and, that and loop so, happens again and again. Right. Cause again. you, you have now incorrectly taught your brain that it was doing the thing, which we would call the compulsion yeah. that stopped the disaster from happening. And that's never been true. So somebody that has say panic disorder or this, I'll talk to agoraphobia for a second, because if people think that if they just stay in their safe bubble, then the bad things, which is just more panic won't ever happen. So the way out of this is you really going into the fear, into the discomfort, into the uncertainty to understand that like, oh, all of that stuff I've been doing to make it go away or stop it from happening has never actually been required. So what I say to everybody, and it would apply you know, very oversimplistic, but would apply to you too, Eddie, in terms of OCD. You can do something when you get uncomfortable, or you could do nothing. They both wind up in the same place, which is you're okay. And nothing is better than something, except you have to go through intentional discomfort to get to that. So there you go. You're that's welcome. A, that's a clip right there. That's a clip. Yeah, for sure. Chew on that one. Sorry. All nothing. Right. Chew on that one. Anyway, I'm um, rambling. No, that no, was, was I'm great. I'm literally writing nothing yeah, he's, greater he's, than. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got nothing is greater than something. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Boom. Just similar to you, Drew, it wasn't a one and done thing. It came back, you know, it reared its head again. Uh, 
I think over the years, um, into my twenties, but it wasn't like the panic wasn't horrible. It was tolerable. Mm -hmm. And it was, I just kind of learned to live with, uh, being lightheaded or whatever sensation it was. And it was fine. I was touring the world as a musician. I was having a good time. Life was good. I was independent. You know, I was driving all over the place. N none of that was an issue. So I just kind of thought, eh, I deal with anxiety sometimes. No big deal. Uh, fast forward to 2017. <laughs> it's like, we're not done with you yet. And uh, it, it came back in, in the biggest way ever. And it had been so long since the first time I forgot what it felt like. Yes. To have that moment. And it, it woke, it was in the middle of the night and I was home alone sleeping. So yeah. I really literally did think this is it. I'm, I'm done. And it was a particularly stressful time in my life. I was uh, changing jobs and all this stuff, but yeah, came back. And that, that's been the, the struggle um, doing so much better now. Like I feel yeah, it's like 80, 80% yeah. there, 85% there. Good. Um, yeah. Thank you. But, but yeah, at that point it was just like, wow, it's yeah. back. It's better than ever. And it was really um, limiting a lot that was going yeah. on. And the fear was very, uh, it was scary. Yeah. And then you learn to avoid those, those scary things, but it's mm -hmm. human nature. Like we are creatures of comfort. We're creatures of the path of least resistance by nature. So we, we want to avoid being uncomfortable. Yeah. And that that's a bad thing in that situation. Definitely. So, yeah, I, that's exactly what it went through. I, I lived it three times, you know, in, in my life. The first time, uh, the second time it got really, really bad. The third time it got really, really bad. So same situation. And when there's a gap between it, you tend to forget. And the reason why it comes back most of the time is that you never actually completed the work, but that's okay. It's not your fault. You didn't even know there was work to complete. Right. So how would you even know there was anything to do? Yeah, wow. And that, that's what tends to happen. People just think, well, I just sort of deal with it. I tolerate it. But they were never given the information that says, oh, what well, this is an actual thing. And I can learn to actually not be afraid of this. And so if like I could be having a panic attack right now, you would have no idea. Mm -hmm. So that is the ultimate goal. But most people don't get that information. So they just kind of wait for it to come and get them. And they will engineer their lives to be okay. I could do stuff. I'm okay. I just don't feel great sometimes or most of the time. And then sometimes you can't engineer the comfort and it comes and it gets you and you don't know why. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's yeah. So it does, I call it engineering an acceptable zone or an acceptable bubble. Yeah. Uh, I like yeah. That. I got to read these books. This yeah. is <laughs> mind blowing. Everybody we'll talk about it at the end, but everybody <sighs> needs to, if, if you're dealing with this, um, fantastic books, uh, podcast, everything. It just, it just reminded me of, of, of in 2018, so about a year of, of this being back, I was supposed to teach uh, drum corps over the summer, and I wasn't going to go. I convinced myself I can't leave my acceptable you, bubble. or Your you know, comfort zone. My comfort yeah. zone. You know, I, I can't do this. And I really was, I was this close to just not going. I was talking to my mom, and I talked to Eddie about it, and, you know, everybody's like, do what you feel like you need to do, but you should go. Like you should go do it. And I did. Yeah. And it was not easy, but I'm so glad that I did. It didn't magically fix things, but no. I was able to, I was able to improve in some areas and just go straight towards the fire, if you will, instead of retreating. Yeah. If nothing else, um, and, and there's a way, I mean, you know now because you've been involved in your learning and you're listening and all that stuff and you've, you're doing a great job. So but there's a way to do this though. It, it's more, a lot of people feel like, oh, okay, I just have to go and do all the scary things. That's true, but there's it's more than just doing the things. However, the fact that you went and took the job and went and, and taught that summer is huge because it at least stopped the backslide of avoidance at a minimum. It kept you from getting into a smaller and smaller bubble, which is what would happen when you give into the avoidance. So we teach ways to go toward the things that you fear that trigger anxiety, that trigger waves of panic. You've got to go toward them, but you have to do it in a way it's systematic it's incremental it's planned there are techniques that we use so it's not just white knuckling your way through the fear getting through it running back home and i did it like mm -hmm. it's it's it's, way, it's more than that it's more nuanced than that it's not super complicated but there's there's more to it than that and that's how we solve these problems by doing that 
Yeah. Um, that's the basis of things like cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy. They're the most effective treatments that we have on the planet today for these disorders by far. It's not even a question anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and I had, I had just kind of stumbled into the CBT, uh, arena before, yeah. uh, deciding to go. So I feel like that, that certainly helped move yeah. me in that direction. Um, but like you said before, I didn't know that there was really work to be done for however many years, 16 years of just kind of, I'll deal with it. I'm okay. You know, so yeah. it's, it's, this is just a thing I have, I guess. Yeah. It's just, that, you know, you don't know. Right. And we don't talk about it. No one educates us about it. Till the, till, unfortunately, we don't get educated about it until you have to be educated about it. Right. Which sucks. Right. means you're struggling. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Which I'm actually curious because I haven't been educated on it at all. Is there, like, well, as performers, there's a lot of us that would get performance anxiety for sure. And I'm now realizing that that's exactly what that was, you know, going up for the solo, going up for that, the whatever you know like it's just going back to my ocd i used to have a trumpet tech when i marched at cadets sean Frilla, Frilla, shout out to sean Frilla. but he would have dct ready for me like the lip balm on the side yeah. before every show and i told him you have to just have this before every show because the one time I, he did and i did and i got it i had the perfect show so obviously <laughs> he was the reason why i had the perfect I didn't show know this. yeah literally for two years straight before every performance <laughs> You would have lip balm ready for me. I have to have the lip balm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I, I'm curious of what, what steps would we take as performers that could help us as we encounter performance anxiety? Well, I mean, performance anxiety, you know, in terms of the performing arts is super common, but that's, that's just being human. That's not a disorder. And it's not even necessarily a thing that you would particularly treat, you know? So how many amazing performers that, you know, that have made amazing successful careers in the musical arts suffer from crippling performance anxiety. And they do, but they just know that like, oh, I'm going to be super nervous until I get on stage or until, I mean, look, even, you know, I'm guessing that that anxiety that you maybe felt as soon as the show started probably went away. You yeah, know, now, now you're time, just performing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you're just performing. But so it, it, that's not necessarily a thing that we would have to treat it's not really a disorder but you could engage in similar techniques like you'd learn from a cbt therapist you know you go toward the things that you fear you challenge those mistaken beliefs like the lip balm that it's a gray area though because that look how many professional athletes like you know i must do yeah. this thing before every game and it's a little bit of superstition it's not necessarily harmful if you if it starts to become a compulsion where you literally feel discomfort and you're experiencing anxiety fear when you don't do those things to soothe your performance anxiety, then you have to start to look at that. But if you're just nervous before performing, it's okay to be nervous before performing. Yeah. I'd say watch yeah. out because it can develop because right now I'm always have <laughs> lip balm. <laughs> since yeah. then. Always. All the time. Just, yeah. I literally, yeah. Well, and they, sometimes they just become habits that are not harmful in any way. They just become like little quirks. So we all have our little quirks and our little safety devices that we carry with us through life. You just have to know, are you trying to avoid the discomfort itself? That's always the, the red flag. Like if I need to get out of this discomfort, then you start to do things because you think the discomfort itself is the problem. That's the red flag. Mm. Like, I'm not sure that you've ever, you know, performance anxiety is usually like, well, the problem here is that I have to go in front of 1500 people and play this, you know, horn concerto. And that's, that's scary, you know, whatever yeah. it is, but, but you know what it is because I have to go and perform and I might make a mistake and I want to be good and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, it's not about the people or the performance. It's about how I feel. That's different. Mm you internalize it is about how I feel, how my body feels, my thoughts, what's going to happen to me, then it becomes an issue. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I, I'm trying to understand the difference too, because I, I felt both before and they're very, very, very different. And you're totally right. Cause once you start the actual performance or whatever that thing is, it usually goes away mm -hmm. or something goes catastrophically wrong and you're just like, ah, I need to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. um, but usually the case is I'm, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Let me just get to it. And then once you get to it, you get through it. Yeah. 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 And people have, you know, like, I don't love to fly. I'll do it. And I'm going to be nervous before I fly, but then, you know, you do it. So feeling anxiety, apprehension, fear, nobody wants to be uncertain. We all want to do a good job at what we do. That's kind of normal stuff. You don't really necessarily treat that. You just have to be careful that it doesn't develop into something else. I, I get, I would get negative thoughts sometimes. Like mm -hmm. you're going to crack that first note. You're going to like, what? This, 
who is saying that? Me. I'm saying, you know, it's, I'm saying you're right. So if you're a performer still like that, that does you absolutely no good to talk down to yourself. You know, you need to build yourself up. Even if you don't believe it, you need to be your best, uh, own best cheerleader and, and feed positive thoughts into your mind before you play. I'm going to nail this. I'm going to have the best show that I've ever had. I'm going to, you know, people are going to love this. Whatever you have to do to kind of reframe that uh, fear um, or that anxiousness to, to go out on stage. Um, yeah, I found that my first, like, the first thing that would, would come to mind is something negative, and I'd have to, like, nope, reframe that yeah. to, to work to my advantage, so... And that's a, we could talk about that for a second if you want. That's a, um, so there's strategies called thought suppression and thought changing that don't really work. So you have to be careful in a disorder situation. You can't, uh-huh. like, if I, if I tell you not to think of something, you're thinking about it right now. If I tell you don't, the famous pink elephant or purple dragon, I don't remember what the experiment is. If I tell you not to think of a pink elephant, you're already thinking of it. Too bad. Like, that's just the way it's going to happen. So we know that thought suppression doesn't work. Thought changing doesn't work, especially in the context of these disorders. But Really, what we're looking at, performance anxiety and things like that, oh, I'm going to crack that first note, that's just, a, we're always seeking certainty. You want a guarantee, an ironclad guarantee that you're going to nail your performance and everybody's going to love you. But there's never an ironclad guarantee. And guess what? Instead of saying, I'm going to rock this, I'm going to be the best tonight, everyone's going to adore me and love me, really the way to approach that is I might crack the first note. But if I do, I'll recover from it. I can handle anything that's going to happen. So the basis of so much recovery from an anxiety disorder and the way we even approach just life anxiety sometimes is to be okay with uncertainty and the unknown. You will handle whatever happens. So if you just like hit a huge clam to start, Oh, well, like you'll recover from that. And then the next night you might be better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's learning to be okay with that discomfort and that uncertainty, as opposed to trying to convince yourself that it won't happen because it might happen. It's true. And your brain is smart enough to know, like, stop telling me that everything is fine because this could actually happen. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. when you fight that thought, then it becomes a never ending battle because your fear center knows, no, you might crack. You might do that. You might you know, flip your mouthpiece out of the, the horn. You yep. might, mm-hmm. whatever, you might, the snare might fall off the harness. We've all seen that stuff happen. Yep. And, yeah. And it, and it can. And if that happens, then you'll deal with it. You have to be okay with that. Yeah, that's, that's cool. That's awesome. Be, being okay with uncertainty. And that's something I, I definitely still struggle with. Um, it's the, the fear of the unknown. And there's no way to know. So no. why? And all the energy? thinking. Yeah, you mm-hmm. can't create certainty with your mind anyway. So you have to learn to just say, okay, right now I want to fight this thought and convince myself and talk myself off the ledge by telling myself that I'm a good player and I'm talented and everybody's going to love me. But really the better strategy is to say, oh yeah, I'm super uncomfortable right now. I, I could just sit in that. It's okay. Yeah. You don't have to follow, you don't have to ride that thought to the nth degree that you're going to crack the note, but like, oh yeah, I'm thinking about that. Okay. I can think about that. It's okay. Just, I love that. I love it. Yeah. It's just a light it's bulb. A thing light bulb episode for me right now because i'm even rethinking yeah. about like all those incredible soloists that blast while we were there before we were there that have they have what you're saying with them like the i'm gonna nail it and, and that confidence with them but mm-hmm. they also have that what you're talking about of anything can happen and i'm not gonna go out over mm-hmm. the out there expecting anything i'm gonna go out there and give it my all but whatever and there was always that sense behind it the court Lins, the adam yeah, rapper yeah. the andrew smith like there was always that like whatever happens happens and then they go out there and nail it at, like pretty consistently right. you know and yeah it, it's funny hearing both sides of that because it, it's almost like an added it's like to ingredients to their cake to make them extremely successful at that extremely yeah successful. i think so and whether it's musical performance or performance in business or whatever your your field of endeavor is, in the end, knowing that you can handle whatever the circumstances, that's deep confidence. Mm-hmm. Confidence isn't like, I am great and I'm always going to nail it. I'm going to be mm-hmm. perfect. I'm not going to make a mistake. Confidence is I might make a mistake and people might not like me, but I, okay, I'll be all right even if they don't. Yeah, that's a very like specific line to like almost arrogance versus confidence. And yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's huge. And it just made me think like it's difficult if you're a perfectionist and that's also an issue. You know, I I would just not enjoy making a mistake and everything could be fantastic. Oh my God, you sounded so wonderful. And if I, you know, one wrong thing, or if I didn't feel it was my best performance, then that Mm -hmm. was, you You know, you get over it, but yeah, it's, it's, you, you do beat yourself up a little bit, at least, 
I, I had issues with that um, in the past, like just perfectionism when it comes to whatever I'm doing, but, but definitely in, in music. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that it's gotten better as you've done some of this like recovery work? Uh, I think so. Uh, I'm yeah. also not playing as much, <laughs> but in, in other okay, areas, well. <laughs> you know, in other areas in life, um, just kind of knowing that you're not going to be perfect and it's okay. But, but what did you learn from this? And, you know, and also that you don't have, you're not, you don't have to be a perfectionist. Mm. Like those are common right. threads with people who have anxiety problems. Yeah. I'm a perfectionist. I'm an overthinker and I'm a warrior. W O R. Why you know? Yes. Yes, right. Those are the common the three yeah. common threads. Or I'm a type mm -hmm. A. People say I'm a type A personality. Labeling ourselves. Okay, well, yeah. Right. Well, maybe you have been, but it doesn't mean you have to be. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes take perfectionism as a sign of achievement. Well, I'm a perfectionist. Well, that makes you feel good to call yourself a perfectionist because it thinks it makes you better at your craft. But it it actually doesn't serve a purpose in the end. So sometimes as part of this process of recovery from an anxiety disorder, you confront a lot of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I've been, it's been driven by my perfectionism, my propensity to worry. Some people think that worrying equals loving. If I'm worried about you, then it must mean that I love you. And if I don't worry about you, then I'm a heartless bastard. But no. that, mom, that's, you're listening right now. <laughs> that that is a very, very typical, well, I'm just a worrier. Well, yeah. no, you think you have to be a worrier. We mm -hmm. don't have to be any of those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we learned those lessons too along this way. So there you go. That's... Your mom's going to laugh at that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi mom. I love you. You're the best. <laughs> Not really. She hey, is. Paul's she mom. is fantastic. Um, yeah. Some light bulbs turned on for me as well. Like, Oh, maybe I could have approached that this way, but it, it's, it's, yeah, I'm going to enjoy like listening back to this one and, yeah. and really uh, writing some things down. So yeah. really quick, I'd love to dive into the what ifs and like catastrophic thinking. And um, cause I, I would say that's my biggest struggle is the what if rabbit hole. And then mm -hmm. from there, um, and, and I'm getting so much better with this, but you know, can you just kind of talk about what that is? Maybe some people are doing this, they don't even realize they're doing it. And um, how can people prevent that from happening or, or get better at it? Yeah. Uh, what if is a super common driver? Those are the, that's the common thread almost among almost any uh, negative or fear fueling thought pattern when you have an anxiety disorder, but just in life in general, people hate what if they just, we can't tolerate it. So the answer to what if is the same as almost every other answer I've given you tonight. You, you this is a, a exercise in learning to tolerate uncertainty and learning to understand that you don't control most of anything. Like you are immersed all day long since the day that you hit this planet in a sea of uncertainty and lack of control. You control almost nothing in the universe. This is true. Absolutely. And so you don't know who's going to win the World Series. You don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl. You don't know what tomorrow's weather is going to be. You don't know what the stock market's going to be. You don't know who's going to be the president. You don't even know if like what's going to happen to you tomorrow. Maybe you'll be in a different career next year or 10 years. Maybe the company you work for will go out of business tomorrow. We are uncertain about almost everything in the entire universe. We tolerate it every day. Just sometimes we pick a subset of the universe that we decide, I don't like being uncertain about that. And then we say, well, we have to engage in what if thinking. And you think that that thinking and wrestling with those thoughts will take away the uncertainty and give you some control. But the answer to what if is always, so what? Always. So well, what, if, what, if, what if I lose my job? So what? If I lose my job, I will... I will deal with that. I will get another job. I will, I have some savings. I'll go sleep on my friend's sofa. Like in, when we do things like CBT, we actually play those, what if thoughts, those catastrophic thoughts all the way to the worst possible conclusion that you can imagine to start to, it's called fact checking. And then you'll see in a rational moment, like, Oh yeah, that's not a very rational thought. So I'm taking a, what if, and I'm turning it into the end of the world. And you could see that that's not rational to do, but even if the bad things happened, you'd be okay. You would find a way to cope. Mm -hmm. And look, people become prisoners of war and are imprisoned for years and years. And that becomes normal and they adapt and they go on with their lives. And I'm just as an example. So, you know, in the end, we deal with what if by answering the question, what if with so what? Okay. So what? You won't, you won't like that though. When you first start doing that, it will make you incredibly uncomfortable mm -hmm. because 
you will be abandoning the, the, the seeking of safety, comfort, and certainty that you're not making anyway. You can't create it with your thoughts anyway. Mm -hmm. So you think you're creating certainty and, and control when you are not. And when you stop doing that, it will make you very uncomfortable. Like you are leaving yourself bare and exposed to disaster, but then it doesn't happen. And then you learn that there was never going to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So this is how we learn to tolerate uncertainty. Wow. <laughs> That's going to be another great clip. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. That clicks Very counterintuitive for most yeah. people. <laughs> absolutely. Because, absolutely. Yes. Because we want to seek safety. We want to seek comfort. We want to feel certain. We want to feel in control. So when somebody says, you got to learn to let go of control, but I'm going to tell you right now, when you get good at those things, you have more control not trying to have control than you did ever trying to hang on tight to anything in particular. Because when you know that you can be uncertain and handle whatever life throws your way, mm -hmm. it's the ultimate confidence and control. Well, I don't have to make it happen. I mean, we, we make things happen. That's true. We, we control our lives to a certain extent, but if a bad thing happens, I know I can handle it and I will. That's great. And so would you, so would both of you or anybody listening, you guys, yeah. you would handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. Cause yeah, well, even as, as you've been going through your journey too, because I, I remember when you had that attack in 2018 and I, I took you to the hospital during one of those and I remember being the so what to her what if and it just took her further down a rabbit hole when it was, I, I forget what the, the exact words, but it was moments of like, well, what if this is happening? I'm like, oh, well, so. and it got worse and worse where I'm on the way to the hospital now because I, I don't know how this loop even happened, you know, and yeah. not realizing yeah. that I was part of the problem. I didn't start the problem, but I didn't, I definitely added some fuel to the fire. It's a hard answer to give the person for sure. And they don't want to hear it in the moment. So there's a little bit more nuance to it. You can't, you don't, you know, in the yeah. midst of the panic, <laughs> so what is, is fuel to the fire a little yeah. bit because yeah, you're insensitive. dismissing. Well, yeah. no, you were, th you, you thought you were, you were trying to comfort somebody that you love. Yeah. And that's a natural thing. Like she's in distress and you're trying to bring her out of that to say the distress. Absolutely. Like you did the right thing, man. Like I give you a high five. Sweet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're off the hook. But in the end to the person who's experienced in that extreme level of discomfort, fear, and terror, you are literally dismissing what they feel is certain death. Like, are you effing kidding me? Like, why, how are you dismissing this? Clearly, I am meeting my demise here. The Grim Reaper is tapping me on the shoulder. Yeah. Why are you being so casual? But, wow. you know, we can make jokes about it, but that's what yeah. it feels like in the midst of when the shit hits the fan, you know? That's mm -hmm. great. So, so what are some things we can do for a spouse, a family member, a friend, if we do see them going down that rabbit hole? Yeah. So when it's somebody that we care about, somebody that we love, we never want to see that person unhappy, uncomfortable, afraid. You know, you don't want to see, you know, you don't want to see Paula in that state at all. And you would do anything you can to try and help her out of that state, right? That's normal. But what we have to be careful about is enabling it and accommodating it. So some people are, especially people who are like a little bit more tending toward being caregivers or fixers, like you will start to accommodate that person's fear. So when your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband, whoever decides, well, I don't, I don't want to go out to dinner tonight. Well, yeah, but we used to do that all the time and you could see the avoidance starting to happen. Okay, honey, it's all right. You don't, we don't, we'll just stay in tonight. That's tough. Or you start doing the chores for them or you start taking over the grocery shopping. You start doing the school run because they can't, it makes them, makes my anxiety. I can't see your cousin because he'll make my anxiety go up. You start to in, in, uh, accommodate those things. You're actually fueling the disorder. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that this person that you care about is feeling genuine fear and discomfort. It's real just that they don't understand that the basis for it is not and go from there. So you really want to be a cheerleader and encourager. Like, look, I know you're not feeling great right now, but how you feel is not necessarily an indicator of reality right now. So how about we just, let's take a walk down and pick up some takeout. How's that compromise? We'll do it together. You know, you'll be, you'll get through it. You're going to be okay. You're always okay. That's a better way to do it than either come on, just pull yourself together. Cause if it was that easy, we would just do it. Can't say that. And you also don't want to be accommodating and enabling. So you got to find that middle ground between like, I recognize your fear. I understand it. I see it. I acknowledge it. But I also need you to acknowledge that the fear is actually irrational and baseless and work with me. I'll stay with you and we'll do it together. And you can get through this. That's the best place to be yeah. hard though. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's great. And I completely agree with that. It's like a balance. Um, because I think what people think they might need is, is not what they should have, you know, being coddled right. is not a good thing. 
um, I think uh, when you're in the midst of that and, and you haven't quite gone through some of the recovery process and you don't really understand the things that you need to do and, or, or you don't understand fully what's going on, all you want is to be safe. You want to feel safe. Yes. You want somebody to, to not be judging you, right? I think that's really important um, mm-hmm. is to feel like uh, you're accepted, okay? Because it's not a proud moment w- no. when, you're, when you're feeling like that. Um, but right. I, I think it's really important not to coddle somebody, which he <laughs> does a really good job. And, and, you know, I laugh about it, but he does a really good job of good. not feeding into that um, side of it. Um, but I think it's like finding a balance, yeah, you know, I think you need a little bit of, un- you need the understanding part, mm-hmm. but you also need the, this is the facts. You've always come out of this just fine. Would you, mm-hmm. would you say you have a hundred percent track record mm-hmm. of, yeah. of getting through it. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that's just, I just want to hammer that in what you said about the finding that balance. Cause it's just, that's this, when you can find that, sweet spot if you will i think that it, it really helps because the, the person that's going through it feels that they're accepted they're supported and they somebody that loves them understands but they're right. also helping them um, not hurting them they're right. pushing them a little bit i think it's okay to be pushed a little bit i think we need that you do need that and i think it depends on the state that the sufferer is in so there's two positions that you could have so Paul, you're clearly, you you know what's going on. You've been doing the work. You've been learning. You've been actively engaged in recovery from the problem, right? So that makes it easier for Eddie to, to be a cheerleader, a supporter, a, you know, prop you up when you need it a little bit. For somebody who doesn't know that and is still, and you talked about the, the first Facebook group. Let's, we should bring that in a little bit now. Yes. Coddling, right? Coddling. And oh, nobody yeah. understands this is terrible. It's the worst. Right. Like, let's all compare our symptoms or and commiseration. Exactly. I yeah, have this. So, Does anybody else have this? Like, right. Yeah, Let, yes, let's yes. all tell each other how terrible it is. Right. And no one understands. We need right. more awareness. My husband is awful. He doesn't understand that I can't go shopping. Mm-hmm. So, if the person is still at that stage of the disorder, which everybody starts at, they, and an anxiety disorder is immensely selfish. The person isn't, but the disorder is is world-class selfish, like Oscar-winning selfish, (laughs) not the person, the disorder. So it will take all the coddling, all the enabling, all the soothing, all the reassurance. It will continually ask for more and more and more and more. So when you, your partner is still at that stage of the game where they want you to soothe them, reassure them, comfort them, hold them, coddle them, and they will not even imagine the idea that they should be pushed toward the fear, different. Because now that person has to take the responsibility that Paula has started to take for her role in it. So it's perfect when you could say, hey, you know what? You've had 100% track record on this. You know what you're supposed to do. And Paula, you could say, that's right. I have to just sit here and let this happen. And I know I'm going to be okay in 10 minutes. That's perfect. But when if you say you have 100% track record and Paula is still stuck at the early stages where she, this is terrible. This is awful. What, what, I shouldn't have to feel this. I should. This is not natural. Don't tell me to be afraid. It doesn't work. It, it, now it's now it doesn't work because now that person is pissed off at you because you're pointing at the obvious to them. It is not obvious yeah. in any way. Gotcha. Yeah. So gotcha. it depends on where they are. Yeah. yeah. And be careful who you surround yourself with that group that you came from. Mm-hmm. Typical, typical. It does. It's not helpful in any way. Yeah. Yeah. I was in there for a very short amount of time because yeah. I, I saw how it just wasn't the direction I was trying to go in. I had been there before, you know, you, you feel sorry for yourself. You wonder why is this happening? I'm tired of this, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. it's it's just, it's really enabling, everybody's enabling each other to to stay exactly where they are and just be in that loop over and over and over. And that's not where I want it to be. Yeah, I can't get off my sofa or I can't take my kids to school. Let me surround myself with 15,000 other strangers who also don't do that right. and will tell me it's okay because no one understands. All right. <laughs> it's rough. Do most, the majority of people uh, experience some sort of setback while they're trying to go through that recovery process? Yeah, they absolutely do. So the recovery process is not linear in any way. Like everybody wants it to be, and we get impatient. And especially when you start to understand the concepts that I'm talking about, it feels like, oh, I had a light bulb moment. So now everything's going to get better. And that's fine. There's two reasons. Number one, there's an inability to understand that just knowing isn't enough. It's doing. So you could watch a a zillion YouTube videos and read books and have the greatest teachers in the world. But until I actually play this guitar and make mistakes and be really bad at it, I will not actually become a guitarist. 
So there's the inability to know that there's work to do. Understanding isn't enough. That leads to setback because people think, oh, and now I know it now. So everything's going to be great. And they'll get temporary relief once they have the light bulb moments for a day or two. But then it comes back and they feel like, see, it doesn't work. That's all wrong. It doesn't work. They haven't done anything yet. The second problem is that people aim at the wrong target, which is I'm going to make this go away. And that's not this is going to sound crazy to a lot of people watching, but that is not your target. So if your problem is anxiety attacks or panic attacks, you are not trying to make them go away. And you're going to lose people. They're punching out right now after I said that. Like, I clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. You are trying to learn to not be afraid of them. And then when you are not afraid of them, then magically they will go away. But you never try to make them go away. So they aim at the wrong target. And then they like engineer two weeks without panic and think, I got it. And then they have a panic attack. And it's like, damn it, I, I failed. Everything is wrong because they think they're never supposed to feel the things. Mm -hmm. That's not true. So that's why setback happens. It's a misunderstanding. It's, an, it's a lack of deep understanding of what the process really is. Maybe they haven't gone far enough in it yet and they're shooting at the wrong target. So there's going to be, so there's going to be days that you feel like you're back to square one. You're not, you cannot unlearn what you've already learned. Right. It can yeah. feel like that though. It can certainly feel um, Absolutely. discouraging. Absolutely. You know? discouraging, yeah. frustrating, you get angry. Like, I just want this over. I mean, man, I had those days. I did. Yeah. So that's normal. So what I always say when you, when you have what you, and here's really in the end, you're going down the road, you're doing the stuff, you learned all about it. And you say you're in a setback. A setback really means I stopped doing what I know I'm supposed to do. And I started falling back into the old behaviors that I know I'm supposed to not be doing. Mm. That's really what makes a setback or a backslide in the end. And when you have, that's, that's a setback, but when you have the days where it's super discouraging and everything, my advice is always be discouraged. Like it's okay. You can be frustrated, discouraged, disheartened, angry, let that happen. It's okay. You're human. And then go back to your, what I call a bad day playbook. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I supposed to do on a day like this? Lick my wounds for two hours, you know, sit in front of a TV and veg out and be angry. But then I have to actually execute my playbook again to get myself back on track. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. There's things to do. So sure. I wish I could tell you all in one answer, but no, that's but, why you got to get this book. Come on. Yeah, well, 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 there you go. That's it. You're hired. Right? <laughs> well, well, let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, so sure. um, you're an author of two books now. I am. Did you Who ever, knew? did you ever think this was going to be uh, your future? Uh, back in no, the in a million years. So I'm actually in the technology business, right? I've been a technology guy since the first dot com boom. And if you had asked me even a year ago or six months ago, I would have said, oh, yeah, I'm a technology guy. I happen to podcast about anxiety and anxiety disorders. These days, I'm, I'm really like an anxiety teacher that happens to be in the technology business. So it's funny how it turned out. In a million years, I did not think I would have ever done this. I, would have, I started helping people as just to pay back the help that I got. And it, I never in a million years would have thought it would have gotten to this point where the podcast is so popular, the community is so big, surrounding it and growing every day. And I actually wrote two books. Who the hell? I never, I, never, I still awesome. don't believe it. Like people post pictures holding the book and I'm like, I wrote that. Like, it's just the strangest thing mm -hmm. ever, dude. I gotta tell you. Congrats. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. Really weird. And really it's, weird. It's, it's going to help so many people. And it already has helped so many people between the podcast and the Facebook groups and all that, which is incredible. Um, it's it's kind of like, you know, you went through all of that, but it was for a purpose. And that's what I feel like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. For me, in the end, like it feels like all the stuff that I went through has a, a silver lining now. It wasn't for mm -hmm. nothing. I learned stuff and it turns out I'm pretty good at relaying the message. I didn't invent any of this, by the way. I didn't invent any of this. I'm just really good at telling, I guess, telling people how it works. That seems to be my thing. Who knew? Well, uh, you, it's it's no nonsense, though. It's to the point. It's you don't beat around the bush. And I, I think, yeah. you know, that style is refreshing because there are so many others that they're doing great stuff, but they don't approach it the way that you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I it's think really easy to digest. Mm -hmm. just, just meeting you for the first time, hearing your voice for the first time. It's really been refreshing yep. and, and really easy to, 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 you present it in biteable pieces, you know, and every time you do bring another layer to it, it's just like, oh, light bulb, light bulb, light bulb. So thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to get into that book. You're very I welcome, guys. I feel yeah. like I'm yeah. going to learn a lot. <laughs> Awesome. So, so let's talk about where everybody can get your books, find the podcast, all that good stuff. Sure. Uh, just start at the website, which is the anxious truth.com. Everything is there. So there's now 120 something podcast episodes going back five years. That's all free. There's uh, links to all the social media, the Facebook page, the Facebook group, which I'm super proud of. It's like the coolest 
bunch of human beings mm-hmm. ever. Um, that stuff is all free. And I give most of everything away for free just because it's a nice thing to do. And I like to do it. And then both books are there. You'll see links to both. The first one is, is a shorter book that's called An Anxiety Story. That's actually my 25 year journey through this thing, yep. which was, the, was supposed to just be the introduction of the big book. And it turned into its own book. Wow. So my, my editor was like, yeah. You're give, how are you writing a second book? So she was a little <laughs> bit blown away by that. And then the second one is called, is also, the book is called The Anxious Truth. That's a 400 page. It's like taking a course in how to recover from an anxiety disorder. And I, wow. I wrote that just because there's so much information and you have to be able to present it in great detail and in a logical sequence because there is a sequence to follow. And that's what that book is. So I'm proud of it, man. People are using it. They're digging it. <sighs> it's, it's helping. So that's why I did it. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. I and love it. Uh, the... You know, the, the cool thing is you went through it. I mean, it wasn't cool at the time, but no. you, you went through it, you lived it, and you found ways to, to re, like, rewire your brain, basically, mm-hmm. and to work through it and to, to rid yourself of it. So because you went through it, th- there's just a different um, relatability for, for the listeners and just people who are searching for information when someone has gone through all the things and and when you guys read the anxiety story uh it's um sorry it's an anxiety story right an anxiety yeah. story so, right uh when you guys read an anxiety story by drew he goes through his entire uh just bout with anxiety mm. panic depression everything's in there and it's so candid and a lot of that was just super relatable um so it was just it was just great to to read somebody's story hear what you went through and having listened to the podcast and all that, and then hear the actual story, it's so inspiring. It's awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it helped in some way. That one was yeah. super easy to write, to be honest with you. When I decided it had to be its own book, I wrote, I literally, I shouldn't say this because some people, were, <laughs> they, it's hard for people to write books. It, was, it is hard to write books. I wrote that book in like four days, the first book. It just, that's just awesome. Just, wow. But because mm-hmm. you're writing your own experience. If I wrote, told you to write a book about, right. you know, your experience with the cadets, you would have no problem writing that. Oh, it would yeah. just fall right out of your fingers. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. I'm curious. Just one last question, I guess, just because I'm, I'm curious yeah, ask as how, many you, as you want. how you would deal with this right now. So after all the information you've learned, 25 years of experience, if you can go back 25 years of that, that first moment we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, that if you can go and talk to that version of yourself, Knowing yeah. what you know now, during that panic attack, what would you right. say? I would say, uh, that's a really good question. If I had to talk specifically to 1986 Drew and like tell him, I have to, I know what I was thinking. So some of the words I, I think I want to say would not have landed. Mm-hmm. So th- you have to experience some of that. What I'd probably say is a really good question, actually. What I would probably say is, you're going to go through some shit right now. Don't fight it. Just let it happen. And you're going to learn a whole lot from this and it's not going to kill you. I would probably say that because it's all that would probably stick mm. saying this is fine. It's just panic. Mm, wouldn't have stuck. Wouldn't mm-hmm. have stuck. Mm-hmm. So basically like you're going to experience some really crappy stuff right now. It's okay. Just experience it. Don't fight it and learn from it. It's probably what I would say. That's I like that a lot. Great tip. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Very cool. It's and there's question. so much in that too. <laughs> Just, yeah. But we'll, yeah. we'll unpack that on the next episode. Yeah. Then. <laughs> we can yeah. do this another is, one. Uh, yeah. Because totally this is pretty surface level. I mean, you, you went a little bit deep, but there's so much more. And all, all your episodes really go into everything in the book, of course. Um, but there's just 400 so much. pages. I didn't yeah. cover it all. So. <laughs> yeah. There's just, there's, there's so much. Um, and just, I just want to talk about this real quick. It reminded me, you also were talking about your, your 20 year old brain is dif- was different than your 40 year old brain and how you yeah. just couldn't process really w- what that was and that there was work to be done, which I thought was really interesting. And I could relate thinking about my 17 year old brain versus where I am now and just how you think differently and, and how things impact you. You know what, in the end, I'm a parent. So, you know, uh, you get to know you want to give your kids, for instance, the benefit of your experience, then I'll listen to them. And I, you know, I, I wasn't listening to my parents. You weren't listening to your parents. And it, it matters when we're 17, 20, 25, it's different. What you're different when you're 20 than you are when you're 30, 40, 50, it, it, things change. But I will say this for anybody who is going through this right now, like 
you're going through fire, but there's gold forged in those fires if you let that happen. So I would, I used to pine for the days when I would be my old self. So to bring it back to the music stuff, I never, I remember sitting at an all state audition, quick, really quick story. This will sum it up, I think, where, it, you know, uh, uh, Nisma. You're yeah. Guy, right? So Nisma. Nisma. Right? Wow. Right, Nisma. So yeah. So I'm at Nisma at West Ice of High, East Ice of High School. Ugh. And I'm sitting, and this is so funny, she'll never hear this, but so I'm sitting and I'm waiting to audition, and it's an all-state audition. And I'm sitting with Pat Nordhausen. Was she was a spectacular tuba player, Pat. She was awesome. And she's sitting and she's sweating and she's shaking and she is just beside herself. And I remember her looking at me and she's like, she, what she actually said was, I effing hate you. And we were <laughs> friends. And, and we started laughing. I said, What's going on? She goes, you never get nervous. And I never, I lived it up until the day of that panic attack. I was bulletproof armor plated guy. And so when the wheels fell off and those bunch of times in those periods of my life, I had to deal with that. I would pine to be bulletproof guy again, but here's the magic. I became bulletproof guy again, but with way more understanding and compassion and humanity. So like you won't ever be the old you you'll, you'll pass the old you you will be better than the old you. So if you just go through this process intelligently and learn from it, you can get out of it and you will be better than you were before it started. I promise. It's a thing, man. It's a thing. So there yeah. you go. That is just... <laughs> Where's the You're killing me, man. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Drew Linsalata. To find all of Drew's podcast episodes, social media links, books, and more, head over to theanxioustruth.com. If you've been enjoying the MVP podcast, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Mind, Body, and Pockets and subscribe to our YouTube channel for video episodes with bonus content. Thanks for the support, and as always, keep taking steps to level up your life.